Hi, I'm Jake, purchasing agent at Amico, providing you with everything you need for clay. This episode is brought to you by Amico Brent. Find your favorite Amico glazes or Brent equipment at your local distributor. Cheers for listening. Happy glazing. Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration, featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit rosenfieldcollection.com. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 456 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, I'm talking with Courtney Martin. She uses a variety of resist techniques to create strong geometric patterns, which are then fired in a wood kiln that lends the glazes a warm depth to their surface. In our interview, we talk about learning pattern making from Mata Artis artists, hand building large forms and expressing her environmental values, through the ways that she works and the way her studio is set up. If you'd like to see examples of her work, you can go to CourtneyMartinPottery.com. I wanted to throw a plug out there for the podcast room that's happening at this year's Ensika. I'll be hosting a live taping of this show on March the 17th, that's the Friday of the conference, at 2.30 in room 212. I'll be talking to Marianne Chenard, Julia Galloway, and Che Ochley about taking an environmental approach to making, so we would love your input on this conversation. There's also going to be a podcast party for hosts and listeners that will be happening at the Rheingeist Brewery on that Thursday, March the 16th at 7 p.m. That's going to be a fun night, and all of the hosts that are participating in the podcast room will be there, so this is a good chance to get all the listeners together. So I hope you'll come out to that event that night as well. Before we get to today's episode, I did also want to thank the folks that have donated to our show. We are listener supported, so I'd like to thank Stephen Earp, Don Katz, and Diane Peach for their recent contributions. If you're interested in becoming a supporter on the show, you can do that at talesoveredclayrambler.com slash donate. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Can you talk about your earliest artistic influences? Like when, when did you see an object or a painting or anything in which you thought, huh, there's something in that? Yeah. So my mom, when she was going to college, she got a full ride to, to Pratt and she didn't go because she didn't think she was good enough. Right. Um, but she spent all of my childhood making art. Um, So when I was a kid, I used to go, she taught at Adelphi University and they had a clay department that she had access to, even though she wasn't an art professor. And so I would go um, into the clay studio with her and she did a lot of like figurative clay, um, often like nudes with live models. And so I have like this deep memory of the smell of clay dust and the smell of that studio. Um, And then in terms of art around the house, I mean, we just... We had lots of art around the house. My family um, had a lot of Native American pots. Um, They collected that kind of thing when my grandparents were younger. And so we had a lot of that around the house that I looked at. Um, And then also I grew up in New York. So one of the things that we did for field trips and my folks did all the time was take us to museums. So I feel like I spent my whole childhood really looking at art. 
Can you explain for folks that are outside of the U.S. or other parts of the U.S. the relationship between Long Island and the city in terms of like getting back and forth and all of that? Yeah. So the town that I grew up in um, is 17 miles outside of Manhattan, but it was like a commuter town. So my dad and a lot of kids' parents uh, lived on Long Island and got on the Long Island Railroad every morning and took the train into the city. And it took about, you know, 35, 45 minutes to get from the hometown to the city. Um, And so, you know, it was pretty easy for us when I was a kid to get to the city. And what did your dad do? He did data stuff on the computer. He kind of bounced (laughs) around from a couple different jobs. I'm so bad as a potter. I have no <laughs> understanding of what people do. <laughs> You're like, it's numbers. I don't know. He did something with the computer. <laughs> I feel like his kids too. Like, but what I related to my dad when I was a small child, my dad worked in hotels and he had a really big chair. And that was the thing I remember the most. It was not anything about his job, but when I would sit in the big chair, which now I see is it was just an office chair. But as a little kid, I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Oh yeah, I love that. Well, one of the th- places that where my dad worked was um, for Pan Am, which is an airline that you know is now uh, bankrupt and defunct. But when I was a kid. Um, he was able, we could fly for free if we flew standby. And so I would get home from school and we would actually be told like, oh, go pack your bags. We're going to go to Rome for the weekend. And we would go to the airport and just wait in line and hope to get on the plane. Um, And then we'd go to these fabulous places and stay in, you know, the crummiest hotels because my folks didn't have a lot of money. (laughs) But I got to go to a lot of places when I was a kid because of that. Wow. Yeah, I mean, the, just the idea that adventure, but having a job like that, that one of the perks was flying standby, the idea that adventure is spontaneous, I think has probably had to soak into your brain in some way. Because a lot of people, like if if I wanted to go to Rome, it would be like months and months of planning, not, you know, okay, we got the tickets, let's go. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of chaotic. I mean, a lot of my memories were about like eating salami in a, you know, pretty trashy <laughs> place, but... Um, I did get to see the Louvre and the British Museum and all those places when I was a kid, which was, you know, pretty cool. Back in the days of uh, travel guides, do you remember when, you know, people would have the little books that would give you like the cheap ways to travel to X, Y, Z? I feel like that was like a whole economy of how can you get to the coolest place with the smallest amount of money? And I'm sure that that I mean, I guess maybe social media accounts are that now. I don't know what the equivalent of those old travel guides is. Yeah, right. I don't know. I haven't done much international travel as an adult, so mm. I don't know. <laughs> well, well, let's talk about when you went to New Mexico to to be in school. Um, how did you end up there? Like, what was the connection? Well, when I was graduating high school, I basically wanted to get as far away from New York as I could, and I wanted to move west. It sounded really idyllic, um, and I had a friend who had gone to the University of New Mexico, so I went out there and visited him and then applied for a scholarship. They gave me a Um, scholarship to pay in-state tuition, which at the time was called the Amigo Scholarship. So I was able to go to University of New Mexico for about um, $1,000 a year. It was really inexpensive. So I made it work. My folks, you know, didn't have money for college. So this was my way to do it. Um, And it was so exciting to move out there. Yeah, that that landscape, though, is just so different. I mean, for one, the lack of humidity, you know, like the the whole New York, I'm, I'm in the New York region as well. And it's so humid here that you can like, sw- it feels like you're swimming outside. And New Mexico <laughs> is like the opposite. So how wh- what were your first impressions? Oh, I just loved it. It seems so foreign and so different. It was so exciting and also terrifying. <laughs> um, but The second semester in college, I took a Ceramics 101 class because I wanted to own a handmade bowl. I didn't even really want to make one. I just wanted to have one. Um, And I was always going to be an art major, but um, taking that class, of course, it's like everybody's story. I just sort of got hooked and didn't stop. Yeah. Who can you talk more about who was there? Like who are the professors there? Gina Bobrowski and Bill Gilbert were my professors. Um, And Gina's still teaching there, I think, or she is just about to retire. Um, And Bill retired a couple of few years ago and they were great. Um, We had a lot, kind of had free run of the studio when I was there. So I think second ceramics two, you were allowed to fire the kilns yourself. Um, And we were allowed to make our own clay, or in fact, we had to make our own clay. There wasn't bagged clay available. It was all, you make it there. They had one of those solar mixers 
And so we would make it like that. And we also had free range of the glaze studio. And so I think I think I took glaze materials before I took ceramics too. And it was really fun to just experiment. I'm I'm no glaze, you know, chemist, but um I did learn a lot of like trial and error and making mistakes in that time. <laughs> Um, but they, they also had um, a really neat facility because they had, I think, three alpine um, updraft kilns. And then they had a couple of experimental kilns that people had built over the years. And the one I used the most was this um, pretty raggedy salt kiln. Um, but it was really fun, you know, because because there was nobody telling us how to do it. And so we just sort of figured it out. And, you know, there's a lot of learning in trial and error and failing. <laughs> Those Alpine updrafts, God, those things are like a rocket. Yeah. <laughs> we had one at App State that was not an Alpine. I think it was like a West. I can't remember what the name of the, the kiln was, but man, it was literally, you to slow the thing down was the trick. It was not like, how do we get to cone 10? It's like, how do we not get to cone 10 in the next four hours? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember being a little bit terrified of the whole thing. <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> But one of the cool things that happened while I was in school, uh, my professor, Bill Gilbert, owned this land just north of Albuquerque in Madrid, New Mexico. And he had bought this, you know, with a bunch of friends back in the 70s and nobody was using it. So um, we went up there and we were allowed to build an Anagama. And, you know, this was in 1998 or nine. So this is like pre-internet. Um, so it was really neat. You know, we like found a couple of books and called a couple of people to draw pictures of what they already had. But like the learning curve of trying to figure out how to build an Anagama kind of was crazy. Like there just wasn't easy resources. And we also had a budget of, I, my memory is that it was of $5,000, which is not nearly enough to buy enough bricks for a 40 foot long Anagama. And so what we did was we bought a whole bunch of fire clay and then we um, mixed fire clay with sand from the Arroyo, which is the drain ditch that was right down below the kiln and we actually made our own bricks. We like mixed that together, pressed it into forms and made brick after brick after brick. Wow. It was so exciting. And, and that works for high temperature. Like you could get a high temperature brick out of that. Yeah. I'll, I'll include some pictures for you so you can see because they're gorgeous. Um, I think that the kiln was recently torn down, but it lasted for close to 20 years, I think. I can't even imagine the tension of that very first firing. Oh my god! <laughs> when, when you're like, "Is the kiln gonna stay together?" <laughs> well, and it was so tricky because, you know, in New Mexico, it's so dry, like we were just talking about, and um, so you kind of have to wait for it to rain because what you don't want to do is set the desert on fire. And it just felt like you know one ember coming out the chimney could do that. So we would wait for it to rain. And then we were firing with like whatever scrap wood we could find, which, you know, I live in North Carolina now, wood is abundant. Um, in New Mexico, it's not. You have to find basically factories that have offcuts. There's not a lot of like actual trees that are easy or free. Um, so we were firing with pallets and uh, leftover scraps from the Santa Fe door company. And It's so funny how wood fire potters follow furniture they follow door come like there's all these <laughs> in industries that we're closely linked to <laughs> that we kind of leech off of. But also actually I think in an environmental sense, it's good that that wood is going to good use because I think if potters aren't using it, I, I, I don't know if they landfill that or scrap it or what, but much better to use it to make pots. I think so. Yeah. Well, the first time we met was actually building a, a kiln together in Connecticut, which I was trying to think about, when that was, I think it was 2001. Does that sound right? Yeah, that sounds right to me. I was still living in Asheville when we did that. I had moved. So when I graduated college, I moved to Asheville and started like working for folks and trying to get a like leg in the door, um, figuring out how to make pots. And one of the potters that I was working with was Sean Ireland, who was hired to build that kiln in Canton, Connecticut. And so I met you there and that was such a cool project. I hadn't met Lisa Stinson yet, and you were working with Lisa, right? Yes, yeah, she was my undergrad teacher, and I was um, working at that studio. She had helped me get a job there, so I was just helping run the studio, the Cant Clayworks. Yeah. Yeah, so I traveled up there with Sean and got to be the studio assistant on that project, and I think, was it three weeks that we worked on that project? I think so, yeah. 
It was relatively quick, and that was. It makes sense that I had forgotten that Sean was there, and he because it was a Ruggles and Rankin design, and I think Sean was probably the conduit to that, or maybe maybe Lisa. I can't remember at that time. Will was, you know, designing a lot of kilns, and your kiln is also a Ruggles and Rankin design, right? It is, yeah, yeah. I actually, you know, after building that kiln with y'all up there, I was involved with a few more kiln builds of Ruggles and Rankin design down here, so. Got really familiar with that design. Yeah, talk about that design. And also for for the wood fires that will geek out about this, talk about that ratio of always thinking of those kilns as they have a big engine relative to like high stack, powerful flue system. Like those things can move if you want them to. So can you talk a little bit about that in the design? Yeah. So Will worked on this for years. I think he started designing kilns like in the late 80s, maybe. I mean, gosh, maybe it was sooner than that. But the ones that I first started hearing about was um, there's a kiln, I think it's in New Jersey, called the Peg Udall kiln. I don't even know who Peg Udall is. I probably should. But <laughs> but this kiln is like um, famous in the little uh, Ruggles and Rankin wood fire uh, crew because <laughs> they wrote about it, I think, in the Studio Potter and included that design and pictures about that process in the Studio Potter article years ago. Um, but anyway, Ruggles and Rankin sort of their personal kiln was a three chamber uh, catenary arch kiln. And I think the Peg Udall kiln was a one chamber, which is like mine. Um, but Will would like really geek out about the size of the firebox to the size of the chamber of the kiln to the height of the chimney. And that, th that ratio was something that he like tweaked and tweaked over the years and improved upon. Um, and so my kiln was one of the like last kilns that he designed. I actually think that my kiln and Josh Kopas's kilns were like the last two that he worked on. Um, or, well, I know he actually helped out with other kilns, but those were the last two that he like designed from start to finish, I think. And so my firebox is, I think, considerably smaller than some of his earlier ones because he really was honing that in my kiln is great. Like it, you really do have to hold it back. My chimney is really tall. Um, it fires beautifully. The thing is like just a dream. It's easy. I mean, it's not easy, but it's, it's very responsive. And I think the difference between that Anagama, the New Mexico Anagama is that you're looking for ash and in your work now, it's, it's about that effect of on glaze. You're not getting, I mean, I'm sure you're getting some atmospheric something on the pots, but it is not, they're not getting hammered. So can you talk about that sort of reduction oxidation back and forth, like what that does for your glaze and why you use a wood kiln to fire glaze? Yeah. Well, so I think that I use a wood kiln to fire glaze. I, when I was in undergrad and we built that Anagama, I feel like um, the community aspect of that actually was a huge draw. I mean, making a huge fire and making the pots was enormous for me, but working together with other potters toward that common goal kind of really resonated for me. Um, and so uh, when I moved to North Carolina after school, I kind of couldn't figure out how someone would make a living making like brown ashy pots. You know, back in the early 2000s, it was still, you know, relatively pre-internet. And I feel like people weren't nearly as educated or aware of wood fire. And so it wasn't kind of as easy a, of a sell in some ways. Um, but also, you know, I worked here and started, or I moved here and I started working with like people like Sean Ireland and I helped Michael Hunt build his kiln. And so starting to be sort of influenced by people around here making glazeware. Um, and then I also uh, worked with Michael Klein for a year, I guess his like first, or I don't know, maybe not first, but one of his first apprentices. And um, he of course glazes everything. And so, um, so yeah, so firing in the wood kiln, it was sort of like a natural extension. Like I really liked the process of it. I liked how directly involved with the flame you are, but then wanting to have glaze where, you know, you can't just reduce the hell out of it or you're going to ruin most of your glazes. And so um, the way this kiln fires, you know, it's a, a constant wave of oxidation to reduction. And um, as you get to learn a kiln, you know, you kind of can tweak it by using a little bit more poplar, a little bit less oak and making that adjustment so that the oxidation reduction ratio is what your glazes need. 
Um, and that kind of thing, I don't feel like I could tell you exactly what that is. It's more of a feeling that I have about the whole thing. Um, that's come from experience, you know, like when I've done a firing and the glaze that I use, my black is very sensitive to like very heavy reduction. It doesn't like it at all. Um, and so there's a couple of parts of my kiln where I don't put that glaze. And also like, I can tell there's like a feeling I have like, oh, that is a little too much. We're going to dial it back. Well, I know when I, I was working at Odyssey and there's almost a glaze lineage in Western North Carolina that's not, you know, like a lot of people think Western North Carolina wood fire pots, but a lot of it's like people using yellow salt and like all these glazes that um, not every studio, but a lot of studios have. But when I was firing yellow salt in the reduction kilns at Odyssey versus coming out of your kiln, that's a wood kiln, you can tell like the difference is there's a warmth there that has to do with that reduction oxidation, which it is very hard to quantify. I mean, maybe someone could like hook up an oxy probe and put it to a computer and figure out like you need exactly this amount. But the practical wisdom is that it looks better in a, in a wood fire kiln. <laughs> Yeah. Well, like that glaze is so great because it's so responsive. You know, it really picks up the direction like that. Um, it also will pick up if it's adjacent to a pot that has colorant in it, it'll pick up little bits of the colorant, which is kind of fun. A lot of your pattern making now is based on resisting either wax resist or um, latex. And I feel like these are like the material. No one is like celebrating like, yeah, latex, it's the best <laughs> in the same way we celebrate clay and glaze and all of that. So this is a weird question, but do you think that those materials, like, do you have a personal relationship with those materials? Cause you use them a lot. Like it is a core part of the process. Yeah. Well, so when I first started using latex, I was trying to get um, different glazes to butt up against each other without overlapping. And for a long time, I was doing that using like wax and creative pouring on. And, you know, that is cumbersome. It does not create a, a straight line in the way that you want it to. <laughs> and um, when I first moved here, I worked for a woman in Asheville named Diana Gillespie, who runs Asheville Tile Works. And she was like, oh, you should try this latex. I've got an extra thing around. So she gave me a jar of latex and I started using it. And it's great because it makes a nice crisp line. And you can peel it off and go back to the bisqueware so you can, you know, overlap glazes. Um, and it's it's a funny material. I have a like mixed relationship with it in some ways. You know, it's not, it's kind of a nasty material um, in terms of like, you know, it doesn't smell great. Uh, it creates waste. It ruins your brushes. Um, but that said, I really want those crisp, clean lines. And latex is the way that I have found best to do that. Yeah, and, and I, I was watching a video. I think the um, Tow River Arts Council had made a video on you for the the tour, and they, it was just watching you glaze. And it was interesting to see, like, you'll let's say you got a round plate, and then you'll take a, a latex circle in that plate, do your first glaze, peel that off, and then wax around the negative space of that, and then put another glaze on. So you're you're getting concentric circles that have, as you said, they bud up, but the question I have is like, it's a, it's a pretty labor intensive process to get the line quality that you want, but it's, there is something relaxed about, you'll make a very tense pattern and then it all blur and fuzz a little bit. So how do you get the right glazes that move enough to, to blur enough, but they don't move so much that it's like you lose everything? Well, I think in terms of which glazes to use, that's sort of a trial and error you know, I've just sort of developed it over time. Some of these have worked, some of them don't. Some glazes don't like to overlap, some of them do. Some of them only overlap in one direction. You know, you have to put one over the other and not the other way around. And yeah, it's a super labor intensive process. I, I think all of us can kind of relate to that. You take a pot and you're gonna just complicate the hell out of it. And I don't know why, <laughs> but um, for what it's worth, I've been doing it for a long time. So I've gotten pretty fast at it. Can you talk about the sources for some of those patterns? Yeah. Well, so when I was in New Mexico going to school, I got to take um, a couple of classes with potters from Mata Ortiz, Mexico. Um, and I, you probably are familiar with Mata Ortiz, but yeah. for people who haven't heard about it much, um, there's a town in Mexico, in northern Mexico, where there's a man named Juan Quesada who um, 
was a very poor teenager out in the woods, basically herding cows. And when he was out in the woods, sometimes he would find pots, you know, Casas Grande's uh, pots. And those pots, if he found them, he could sell them for a good chunk of change. So he would, you know, he was stoked and he would sell them. And then he started thinking, well, these people who made these made these with materials right here. So while he was out there, like herding these cows, he would trial and error make pots. And um, I think it's sort of like a, a known secret that he would pass them off as authentic at first, you know, to try to make some money, but then sort of that transitioned into him actually kind of creating this whole movement of Casas Grande's revival pottery in Mata Ortiz, Mexico. So when I was in undergrad, I was really lucky to get to spend two weeks out in the desert um, making pots with Juan Quesada. And one of the things that I really took away from that was the way they divide up space. He would talk about um, how like, it's, you know, it's pretty easy to eyeball dividing into two or four, right? And then it's like a little bit less easy, but still pretty doable to divide something eyeball um, into threes. But like, if you can eyeball it into dividing it into sevenths, like that's when you know you've got it. And <laughs> I just, I love that. And, you know, so when I'm making pots, I usually, or I always just eyeball it. And, and it's, I don't know, that's sort of where I start with patterns. Um, I look at a lot of stuff, you know, geometry like that is sort of universal. Most cultures have some sort of geometry that they use on pots. And so I look at a lot of pots. I wouldn't say that there's like one culture that influences me more than others. A place um, that I think, or a source that I think is really interesting is um, mud cloth or bogola fina, where the artists who are making that kind of clearly have a pattern in mind when they're starting. And so these claws, you'll see, they'll go along with a certain pattern. And then toward the end of the piece, they'll almost run out of room or the space won't be quite right to continue that. And that's when something weird would happen. And um, and that's when it gets really good. So that kind of geometry, I don't know, that makes me the most interested. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that I think is the same as what I think of in my head is the ant farm pattern, which is where things like they keep changing direction and somehow it all fits in a space, but it it's not it's not logically based on math. It's more based on movement within a set boundary. And when I look at your pots, I was this like taller basket form had that all over it, but like that is not easy to do. How do you accomplish that without it going completely to hell? <laughs> like, how do you, <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> it's it's interesting because you know when I make the glazeware, when I'm glazing pots, um, I draw all those patterns with pencil first, and then I work on it. So you know I can erase essentially. Um, but then, like the basket you're talking about, I I've started carving into pots a lot more. And carving, you can't erase, which I think, you know, it's like harder and, you know, I mess it up sometimes, but also it gets way more interesting sometimes. So it's something I've been thinking about a lot. Like, how do I keep that energy into the glaze where, where I have more control? And I think that I tend to be kind of, um, oh, what's the word? Like, I want things to work out, right? <laughs> I want to be like in control of things. And so having it go haywire in a way that still feels controlled enough to me, but has that energy is a real trick. And, you know, every once in a while, I feel like I really succeed with it. But a lot of the time I feel like, oh, it's just not quite there. There's a lot of skin in the game with that. You know, like the risk is there and and the rewards are great if it, if it, <laughs> if it works out. Um, <laughs> can you talk about how you approach patterns on some of those? You make some of those really big square, like platter forms that can be pretty intricate as, as a pattern. The form is is somewhat simple, but the pattern is intricate. But then you're also, you know, hand building those or coil building those really large jars. But then the, there'll be a similarity in, in pattern on two of those forms. But I know it's very different to divide the vertical versus the horizontal. How do you, how do you approach that in the form or with the pattern on the form? Well, I, I'm going to be honest. I think like the Platters, I love making platters. I feel like platters are are easier for me. It's like a flat surface that visually and mentally it's it's a hurdle that's easy for me to get jump over. I know what I want to put on that. A round form is way harder 
um, especially like a bulbous form, like a cylinder is one thing, but a bulbous form, most of the patterns that I'm really into get really complicated when they stretch in different ways. So I don't know how to answer that exactly, but um, I think it's kind of a trial and error and doing my best kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. The bulbous forms, I tend to go more with them like simple patterns, you know, like zigzags and stripes, which tend to work out better. And then um, relying heavily on the kiln to do its like glaze magic of overlapping and adding some directionality from the flame. Yeah. And behind you, I can see that there's this big, nice jar. Can you talk about wanting to hand build in that way? And I guess it's similar with the rectangular trays where you have like a larger coil that becomes that wall. But when I was when I was watching videos, I was noticing that there is a the amount of clay you use is not precious. Like it felt like I need substantial walls, so I'm going to use enough clay. But in my mind, if I would build that, I think I would not use enough clay, and the pot would be dinky. Like there's some heft to your pots in the decisions you're making of the method you build. Can you talk about that? I recently realized that that actually kind of stems back to Mato Ortiz too. I didn't, I only put this together last year, but one of the construction methods that they would use where they would take a small slab and put it into a little mold that was called a pookie. And then you take a fat coil and you put that coil on top of the edge of the slab and you'd pinch that whole coil into one pot. It would just be like one coil, one pot. Um, So that between that and then working with Holly Walker, who does a lot of like big coils um, I think is where I've come to this technique. So, you know, generally what I do is for a platter, I'll roll out a slab and take a pretty fat, you know, one inch or so diameter coil, put it around the outside. And then um, I pinch it, you know, until it's the shape that I want it to be. And then I take a rib and I do the inside so that it's smooth and the way I want it to be. And then I let it set up and I come back and take care of the outside. Um, and I think that for me, the, the like thought process behind that, one of the things I got to do in undergrad again was study with a man named Jim Schrubeck, who was teaching the um, porcelain making traditional Arita style porcelain. So he studied in Japan and came back and taught us this. And that, that process was all about the interior of the pot. And so we would throw off the hump and make these little rice bowls where you use this ski tool. It looks sort of like a ski. And you'd make that curve and it was, that pot was all about the inside curve and you'd make the outside match it. But, you know, once the inside curve was right, um, you'd let it set up till it was almost completely dry. And then you'd trim the outside to match the inside. And this was a method where the goal was to trim it thin enough so that it was translucent, um, which obviously is not at all what I'm doing now, but I love that idea of like, you know, you fix that inside to be what you want it to be and then let it set up and then make the outside match. So for platters, I use that for doing taller stuff or bulbous things. You know, I just coil until it's done. And I like using pretty big uh, coils. I like working really wet. I don't want the clay to be stiff at all. So a big wet coil is sort of the way I go. And, um, you know, I just pinch it till it's thin enough. and you know, I can probably get, I don't know, three to four inches of height per coil. It goes pretty quickly. They're not paddled, right? It's only pinched. Only pinched. I mean, I think that some of the like Ongi techniques like that with the paddling, the like the thought behind it is sort of similar, you know, or like I'm pinching to match below it like that in the same way, but no, it's not paddled. And so in your studio, what's your workflow? Like, are you making like the, like the jar behind you, do you just make that one pot till completion or do you got a bunch started? What, how, how do they work in the space? Well, it varies. Um, but yeah, I usually I'll start a number of them at once. Um, you know, like a lot of people, I try to switch up what I'm doing in the studio so that I'm not injuring my body. All of these processes, if you do them repetitively or too much. So like that jar behind me, I think I started three of them and I recently saw Giselle Hicks starting them from the center in. So I started doing that too. I think it's brilliant. And um, so, you know, I, she was saying, I think she says she does like 10 at a time. Um, but I was doing more like three at a time. And so I'd start from the uh, middle of the pot 
and coil to the foot essentially, and then let it set up. Well, then do the next one and then the next one and then let them all set up. And then the next day, you know, put a foot on it and flip it and, and like that. And so, but then also in between that, I would, I'm doing all the other things in the studio, like making other slab pots or throwing a little bit. So I try to break it up every day. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause I know pinching and I, from talking to Giselle, I know that like, if you pinch all the time, you get elbow issues. Like you just can't make that physical movement all day long. No, it's too much. Yeah. It's really satisfying, but it, you can just really hurt yourself. <laughs> so can you talk about the greater Pinland community? Like how, now that you're established there, you've been there for a while, like, and, and your husband is an artist as well. Like how did, how do you support the community and how does the community support you? Yeah. So we're so lucky. There's, I don't know, I think according to the studio tour maps, there's in the neighborhood of like a hundred plus artists around here. And there's definitely well over 50 potters around here. Um, In terms of how the community supports us, I think that there's sort of a critical mass in terms of how many of us are here. And so we're known as like a destination to buy craft. Um, John and I have been in our spot for almost 20 years now. And so we do actually have like a lot of people who know that we're here and will come by to buy work um, and who will bring their friends by to buy work, which is amazing. Um, And I don't think that that would happen if there wasn't so many of us here. Um, And in terms of how we support Penland, I don't know. Penland's wonderful. You know, Penland throughout the pandemic and the years since has done everything that they could to keep everybody employed at school and, um, in the fall of the pandemic, they asked me if I would come in and record a demonstration video in a class. And their intention behind it was to keep their programming going, but also to support the local artists. And so there was three of us who did it. And, you know, it was such a like oasis in the sea of COVID because I got to be around other humans and work with people and create something that I'm proud of. Yeah, and that that desire for the school to take care of their employees and also the area. I don't know if I've if I've talked about this publicly, but there was a grant I was supposed to teach at Penland and it, and it was canceled. But there was an anonymous donor that gave enough money that at Penland Haystack and somewhere else, all of the people that were teaching still got paid. That's right. I think it was five craft schools that got, that yeah. did it. Yeah. I also was going to teach in 2020 and um, got paid for not teaching in 2020. When they called me to tell me that, I almost started crying because I, it was that amount of money was exactly the amount we had just bought a house. Like shit was going to hit the fan, and they kind of stepped in and 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 saved it. And I think craft schools do that. I think there's many stories like this where they are the conduit for financial support to artists in the area. So I don't know who gave that, who whoever that anonymous donor was, <laughs> bless <Yeah>. them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was amazing. That was such a gift. That was huge for everybody. <laughs> so can you talk about balancing the workflow, John's workflow as a glass artist and yours? Like, are your guys' pressure points all the same in terms of like galleries want work at the same time? Like, how does it work having two artists in different mediums in terms of yearly workflow? Yeah, well, all of it's really shifted. It used to be that, you know, John and I did a lot of craft shows not too many years ago. And so that would be a major deadline that we were either both racing towards or one of us was racing towards. Um, at this point, I i don't want to do craft shows anymore. That business model doesn't make sense for me anymore. Um, I've been lucky through the pandemic to find out that I can sell work online. And so that's really made my schedule a lot more flexible. John also sells work online, but his price points are a lot higher than mine. And I feel like glass sales are not in the same place as pottery sales. So he's still doing more in-person stuff and more gallery work. So I don't know. We kind of just take turns. We actually try to not have our deadlines be at the same time because in terms of our piece at home, it's easier (laughs) if one of us is cranking and the other one can be the support. And it's probably practical also with the kids because if like the kids are sick, someone's got to take care of the kids. So if if the deadlines are at the same time, you're kind of screwed if that happens to be the time they need help. Right. Exactly. Well, and one thing that we realized a couple few years ago was that, you know, the the priority is the kids. And so, so what if we get a lower paycheck, you know, like we're luckily in a place where our overhead is very, very low living in very rural North Carolina. 
Um, and also having owned our house for 20 years now, like we're in a pretty kind of easy place in some ways. And so taking a pay cut in order to be home more has been really positive for us. For young artists that are listening to this, how do, how do you, do you have any thoughts on how they could um, sort of settle in that area? You know, like in terms of finding the right place to live, artists to work with, like, do you have any words of wisdom? Yeah, well, it's tricky around here. It used to be that houses were really inexpensive and it wasn't too hard to find them. Um, and that's really shifted right now. I think houses are very, very expensive for where we are. Um, and in terms of rentals, it's the same thing. It's very hard to find rentals around here. So I think it's pretty tricky. I actually haven't, you know, I've, I have an assistant and I have had an assistant for years, not the same assistant, like numerous assistants. And um, I've never really advertised with it nationally because I don't, I feel like it would be hard for, hard for me to take on having someone move here to work with me. Just there's so many logistical kind of things. Um, but that being said, there are lots of potters around here who are looking for helpers. You know, that's a pretty regular thing. Um, and my husband, you know, hires glass assistants all the time too. So there's, you know, it seems like living here, we've, it's gone in waves where there's either like plenty of people around to help or no one around to help. But, <laughs> you know, that's how I ended up here was just moving here to work with potters. And I, when I graduated college, you know, not only was I not, qualified or good enough yet to have like a real residency. But I just couldn't ever figure out how people did that, how you could go many, many months or years without a paycheck. And so I moved here with the intent to work for people. And, you know, that worked out pretty great. Yeah. And getting paid to learn, like if you're a young potter, you can spend nine months with this person and then go spend six months. Or I mean, when I was at Odyssey, a lot of people would work for three or four people and that's how they made their living. They would drive up from Asheville and, and it was, I mean, you know, you had to pay for the gas, but besides that, it was, you were getting paid to learn, which is perfect. Yeah. Well, yeah. And just to spend time in the studio. So, you know, watching, um, I worked for Michael Klein and Terry Guess, both of them for a very long time. And both of those guys, there are things about their studio and their practice and their like business model that I've taken and absolutely use it, you know, directly. And then both of the, you know, everybody that I've worked for, there's been things about their business model where I've been like, I don't understand this at all. This doesn't make sense <laughs> to me. And so that part, you know, just learning that that wouldn't work for me is helpful too. When you mentioned that John has assistance, I never thought about like glass, the demands, if the furnace is on and you're, you're actively blowing or working like the demand, the, it's physically demanding, but also d he has to have an assistant, right? Like it's, it would almost be impossible to do that on your own. Yeah. I mean, there are people who do it, but yeah, the, he's really shifted his practice. We used to have the furnace on kind of all the time and he would be blowing glass all the time and he was hiring someone basically full time. And that just doesn't work for us anymore. He's more efficient. He's able to make more work quicker. Um, and then have the furnace off more. But yeah, it's it's hard to have something, you know, the furnace is at 2000 degrees all the time and that's just gas going away. Or actually it's not gas anymore. He is an electric furnace now. But it's still it's still very expensive. But yeah, that's a that's kind of a cool thing. He switched to an electric furnace right before our daughter was born and this past year we actually put a massive array of solar panels on his glass shop. So we've had solar panels on our house for 11 or 12 years. And now we have like so many more solar panels. Will that power that furnace? It's all solar? Well, we were looking at our bills. It looks like it is covering two thirds of it. Wow. Yeah. So it's not all of it, um, but it is a lot of it. And, you know, the way to calculate it too, because we've only had the those on for, I don't know how long we've had them on, but we need an annual before we'll be able to see how well it worked because, you know, the way the solar works is that it uh, we're grid tied. And so it goes, we feed back into the grid and then we have credits that sort of roll over in North Carolina. Those credits um, get erased in May, which is because North Carolina on a whole is a climate where people are using their air conditioning and they use more power in the summer. So it suits the power company for it to roll over in May. Um, but it actually happens to suit us pretty well, too, for it to roll over in May because John is off during the summer. So we're just acquiring credit then. 
But yeah, it's exciting. We're really um, proud of that investment. It was, you know, no small thing. And um, it's a little hard to tell via the internet, but I think we might be one of the only glass shops in the country that really is powered by solar like that. Yeah. And this is actually a topic I wanted to talk to you about is, is how you put your political and environmental values through the way that you work. And I think the solar is, is one of them. But there, I think, did I see you guys did a fundraiser for Sunrise Movement? Is that, what? what's the name of the movement? Yeah, it's Sunrise Movement. Yeah, it's a youth-led um, environmental organization. Yeah, can you talk about that in, in, in the bigger picture, just how you live your values through the way you work? Yeah, so that's always something that's been really important to us. The Sunrise Movement is a group that I... I don't feel qualified to talk about too in depth, but I actually learned about them through my daughter who got involved with the Sunrise Movement in school. And it's very cool, you know, youth led uh, climate um, activists. And so, yeah, so one of the things that happened when the pandemic started was I started having online sales. And then in conjunction with that timing, of course, was all the Black Lives Matter movement. And me, you know, I've always had these environmental concerns, but me becoming much more educated and aware of environmental stuff. So I put a, I don't know what the word is. I made a stipulation for myself that every online sale, I'm going to give 10%. And so I give 10% to either a Black Lives Matter organization of some kind or an abortion fund or a climate fund. It's great. It feels really good. You know, I, every once in a while I get people saying that they aren't going to support me because of it. But for the most part, I actually think that people feel really good about that. 10%, you know, like in the religious context, tithing was 10% to the church. So I do love this idea that secular, well, I don't know if you're religious, but like secular people are just making a choice. Like this is an amount of money that's not going to kill us but to, to give it away, but it does help us to feel like we're engaged with the issues. Because one of the things that I run into with people like older generations, like when I talk to my parents and older folks, I think there's this concept of like, eh, I can't really make a difference, so I'm just not going to do anything. And I, I, I think a better approach is maybe like, what's the smallest thing I can do to make some difference and keep going as much as I can? Yeah, well, like the Sunrise fundraiser. I've done a couple of them, but last year in the fall, I got together a few potters to do it with me. And I think we made, and it was a little hard to tell. I told people that they could donate whatever they want to Sunrise Movement. So I didn't actually get a total of what people did. One donation equals one entry. And I encouraged people to give what they felt like they could. So I don't exactly know how much we made, but I think it was around $2,000. And then the person who won our collection, um, She was saying that she actually didn't give that much and she felt like she should have given more and she gave more, but not only did she give more, but then she started really researching Sunrise Movement and she found two other climate um, activist groups that she was like really moved by and she gave to them. And then she and her partner somehow partnered with uh, her partner's business to have like a monthly thing that her business was giving. And so like that kind of exponential awareness is so exciting. Yeah, and I think that uh, that's another value of doing these types of things is awareness building. Like the money is helpful because these organizations are often using legal um, means to to fight climate change, and that costs money. But the more awareness you can build, that that's hard to put a price on, but it's a valuable thing. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I feel you know I've got this like small Instagram following, and the amount of times that people say, "Oh, I hadn't heard of that yet," you know, it's it's pretty cool. I feel really good about that. Well, well, I wanted to wrap up talking about Clay to Table and what you guys are, are are doing with that. Can you talk about that that show? Yeah, so Clay to Table stemmed out of Cousins and Clay. I was a member of Cousins and Clay for a couple of years. And when that group disbanded, um, Michael Klein, Kyle Carpenter, myself, and then we took we brought on Gerald and Verdon, um, started a group called Clay to Table. And, you know, as someone who's organized like small scale craft shows, for years, I've, I've been heavily involved with the Spruce Pine Potters Market for a long time um, also. And, you know, these small invitational craft shows tend to be like pretty white. And I've been really involved with a lot of them where it's been all white or like almost all white people. And it hasn't felt right for a long time, but I haven't felt the power to do anything about it. So anyway, when we started Clay to Table, our intention was to really just try to mix people of 
different backgrounds, different abilities, different stages of their career. Um, and so we like very carefully put together the first group of 11 guest artists plus the four of us. So there's 16 of us total. Um, and then, you know, I've been doing a lot of reading about access and where those spots are. And one of the things that really excited me was that, you know, juries tend to be a point of access that is hard to get across. And so with Clay to Table, we were really excited to turn the jurying process over to our artists. And so the first year's artists chose the second year's artists. And, you know, that's so cool when they, so we asked everybody the first year to submit three names and then we went through them and like one or two of the people that were submitted weren't quite um, at a level where we thought that they would succeed with our show, but everybody else, you know, we kind of just put them in a group and then decided, okay, these 11, you know, we made sure we got one person from each artist. Um, and so anyway, then our second year's group was amazing too. So we're excited about it. Um, and then also played a table. We uh, going along with this like tithing or uh, using our voice for activism. We partnered with Crafting the Future. Um, and so what we did was each artist donated a piece and we sold tickets toward a raffle or a sweepstakes. And then the winners um, took those pieces home. We called them pottery starter kits or pottery collector starter kits. And I think we made in the neighborhood of $5,000 the first year. And I think we made, oh gosh, I'm going to get the number wrong, but a little bit more than that last year. So that's great. And and that goes to crafting the future, which then that money's used for scholarships for artists of color to go to, I think it's to the, to the, the big five craft schools, right? Yeah, it's the big five craft schools, but they've also expanded into a few other places. Like I think that they are um, funding some residencies and doing a couple other mentorship kind of programs. They're kind of like branching out a little bit. Yeah, it's a it's a really cool group of people crafting the future. The Clay to Table, is that a physical show or is that only online? No, it's only online. Yeah, we've talked about it. I mean, Clay to Table sort of in flux right now. We're trying to figure out the best way forward because it is a tremendous amount of work for the organizers. And this is unpaid work. We didn't get paid for any of it. And we kept our booth fee very, very low and didn't use that for anything other than advertising and, you know, dealing with the costs of the show. Um, so we're trying to figure out a way to have the organizers not be overworked, but still, you know, accomplish our goals. And I think this is a common thing where there's so much energy. And, and I mean, this started in, in the time of the pandemic where people were home more, which I feel like a lot of things started then because you feel like you have energy to spend. But then now as people are going back to in-person shows and other things like that, that's a whole another level of energy expenditure. And it's like, hmm, can we do this without burning out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's super tricky. And a lot of the energy is like, directly in social media, you know, like in order to get loud and get that energy happening. Um, it's like a lot of spending time on Instagram, which is hard. It's hard on the body. It's hard on the, like, it's too much. So to wrap up, can you leave your website and also social media so people could get in touch if they want to? Sure. My website is CourtneyMartinPottery.com and my Instagram is at Courtney Martin Potter. Well, thanks. This has been great. Yeah, thanks so much, Ben. I appreciate it. I'd like to thank Courtney for taking the time to do this interview. It was a pleasure to chat with her and reminisce a little bit about our days building kilns in a very hot summer in Connecticut about 20 years ago. So a pleasure to talk with her, and I hope you guys will check out her work. Before we go, I'd like to thank today's sponsors. That's Amico Brint, the Archie Bray Foundation, and the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, you can get in touch through our network website. That's brickyardnetwork.org. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. 
Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.